Howdy everyone, so now what we'll do is we'll carry on our discussion about uncertainty for subsurface modeling and we'll talk about how do we represent uncertainty. So first of all, the most correct answer would be for subsurface modeling and geostatistics, we make use of what's known as random variables and random functions. The concepts are actually quite straightforward might sound a little complicated, but let's see if we can take a run at it and make it very practical for you. A random variable is simply a property at a location. Recall u alpha would just be a location vector going to a location in the subsurface that can take on multiple possible outcomes. We represent this with a probability density function. And so you could imagine at a specific location in space, we would have a PDF representing the range of possible values and their associated densities or interval probabilities. And from that distribution, we could imagine we could sample from the random variable multiple possible outcomes, which we would call local realizations. Z1 through N would be N possible realizations. Now, of course, it's important for us to be able to estimate at a specific location in space, but for the purpose of most of our transfer functions, most of our calculations in the subsurface, we need more than just one. We need a exhaustive or comprehensive set of locations and variables sampled in space. And so we would need to work with multiple random variables. We got a random variable here, multiple possible outcomes, random variable here, multiple possible outcomes, and they're represented by their local PDFs at these different locations. Now, if we were to take multiple random variables and we were to correlate them, spatial, temporal correlation, and we impose that correlation on them so that if we draw a realization right here on this random variable at location U1 that is high, we would expect to draw something that's high or maybe medium over here and maybe low over here if there was a significant amount of correlation between those locations. As soon as you take random variables at locations and impose spatial continuity between them, you're now working with a random function. And when you sample from that random function, you draw jointly at each one of these random variables at their associated locations and the result is a realization in space or temporally or maybe both. And so we use random variables and random functions. Now the way that we represent uncertainty in the subsurface or spatial problems is we use multiple models. We'll have a model, a model, a model, and each one of those could be considered equal likely, equal probable, and we'll talk more about that. But we could break them up. Because we have, not only do we have spatial uncertainty that we talked about before, we have parameter and model decision uncertainty. When you change the input decisions and parameters, you have created a new scenario. So a scenario is comprised of multiple realizations we'll talk about right away, for which the model decisions and the parameters have been held constant. You have a set of scenarios when you vary those model decisions and parameters. What is a realization? A realization is when the input decisions and parameters are held constant and only the random number seed is changed. Now that might seem kind of simplistic, it might not seem like a big deal, but we mentioned in the previous lecture that even if you know perfectly well the scenario, the model decisions, the choices, and the data, you still have uncertainty in between the sample locations, spatial uncertainty. You capture that through multiple realizations. It's very interesting. In the good old days, we used to build all of our uncertainty through realizations, and we've definitely shifted to more focus on scenarios. But often we've forgotten about the value of incorporating multiple realizations at the same time. And that will come up over and over again during this set of lectures on uncertainty. We work with multiple models. It is generally not appropriate to analyze a single scenario realization or too few of them. 
We will mislead ourselves. We will not come up with a good decision. We have to consider jointly a reasonable set of scenarios and realizations. Now, basically, how would we sum this up? Use all the models all the time to apply them to the transfer function. When we have a decision to be made, we take the function that gets us as close to dollars to value as possible. That could be flow simulation, volumetric calculation, something about contaminant and transport to flow rates, whatever it might be. You would go ahead and apply all the models to that transfer function so that then you can make a good decision. I want to give credit to Clayton Deutsch, my PhD advisor, went on a speaking tour recently, I think just last year, and was really focusing on this idea of use all the models all the time. I think that's great. Now, let's talk about how we represent uncertainty a little more mechanistically, the mechanics of it. What, what are we really, really doing? Now, if you think about it, what's interesting is we measure dispersion or variance within properties with the variance. We've done that. We understand that. You can understand a distribution that has a narrow variance, a distribution that has a wide variance. And we are measuring and modeling uncertainty with distributions. And so we could suggest that variance is a way that we communicate uncertainty, that a zero variance random variable would in fact have no uncertainty and a large variance random variable has a high degree of uncertainty. Now, so let's think about variance. Variance is just a specific form of dispersion variance. The dispersion variance is a much more generalized form of variance that accounts for the scale of the data and the scale of the thing that we are working inside of, the area of interest. And so we can calculate the dispersion variance quite generally, accounting for our data support or the support size of the model cells or whatever we're considering within some other volume. That could be the area of interest, maybe a subset of the area of interest. We can do this in a very generalized manner. We will cover shortly much more about scale and dispersion variance. Actually, if I think about it, I think we already covered it, but I'll make sure the lecture is put up shortly. Now, it gets a little tricky if you're talking about categorical variables, discrete variables, because what happens is that we have variable category one, two, three, and category three could be category 15. There's no real meaning to the categories often. They may not be ordinal. And so what does that mean is that we're in a situation in which if you try to calculate the variance based on the actual values, it doesn't have any intrinsic meaning. And so we would not get a number that's meaningful. People have used other measures such as entropy, which can be seen as very useful for categorical variables. Maximum entropy is when you have a uniform distribution, equal probable in all categories. And minimal entropy would be when all of the probability density is in a single category, 100%, which would be no uncertainty. And so that could be a useful way to communicate uncertainty for categorical variables. But we can go a little bit further. Now we've accepted that variance is the way that we communicate uncertainty. Let's go back to thinking about trend modeling and partitioning of variance between trend and residual. If we take this data set right here, and without too much imagination, we could suggest that there's a pretty good trend in the data. This could be location and space, and this could be a property of interest, porosity, permeability, such. It doesn't matter. It's a property. If we fit a linear trend and we calculate a residual, we would, we would know from fundamental concept of the additivity of variance that the variability of the total problem is equal to the variance represent within this trend model plus the variance represented by the residual from the trend, from the data to the trend, plus two times the covariance between the two. Now, generally, if we've done a pretty good job of trend modeling, the covariance between the trend and the residual should be close to zero. And so we could say the total variance is equal to the deterministic or known trend plus the stochastic unknown variance that goes to the residual that's left as uncertain. 
So given this, we can recognize that when we build a trend model, we're partitioning the total variability, that uncertainty, into a known and an unknown category. We are directly returning a dial with the strength of the trend, and we're moving more of that variability into known versus unknown. And you could imagine if there's no trend, all the variability is in the, the residual, it's all unknown. If you overfit the trend, we'll be in a situation where all of the variability is basically within the trend. And so we're partitioning that variability between known and unknown. But there's another interesting partitioning that goes on. When we talked about spatial continuity, varigram calculation, and the use of nested varigrams, we explained that, in fact, what we're doing is we're partitioning the variability represented by the sill between multiple bins or additive spatial features or nested structures. In fact, 40% or so of the variability right here is nugget effect. What are we saying? That is uncertain immediately at epsilon away from the data. At a very short distance, we immediately have that spatial uncertainty or that variability returns. Then we have about 20% or no, 40% of the variability is this long range structure, a spherical structure that goes out to almost 40 kilometers, I think. So we're saying that we have that predictability for about 40% of the variability and then the remaining 20% is some type of long range trend structure. And so what we can see is the fact that we are partitioning spatial uncertainty using an additivity of spatial structures that describe the different components of the variance. And once again, we said that that is related to our uncertainty. So this is very cool. Now, in fact, what's very interesting is if you take the simple Kriging system and you calculate the simple Kriging variance shown right here, and if you simplify it to a problem for which you only have one data and one location you're estimating away from that data location, the whole system of equations will collapse and you will find that that Kriging variance is simply equal to, in fact, the varigram, the varigram value. And so this is very, very powerful. In fact, we can start looking at the additivity of spatial continuity features, the nugget, the spherical and trend that are describing different components of the variance. And we can say that when it comes to spatial uncertainty, we are directly partitioning it and describing it with different spatial frequencies. And this is super powerful. So another way to think about it, partitioning of the variance between known and unknown in the trend and partitioning the variance between different spatial frequencies that have different degrees of predictability over distance. Now, I don't want to suggest that everything's easy. There are some interesting things we can see about uncertainty. We can learn a lot, but there's a lot of very big challenges that remains in the field of understanding and modeling uncertainty. Discrete. That's very challenging. If you imagine, in fact, that if we're thinking about the subsurface, it's not a smooth, continuous type of uh, parameterization. Often it is a situation where the subsurface could be deep water lobes. The subsurface could be deep water channels. And both of those behave very differently when it comes to our transfer function, which could be flow simulation recovery and so forth. So we have to work with discrete representations. We have scenarios that say, okay, channels and lobes. You could imagine you have a compaction trend for porosity, yes or no. There's all kinds of discrete cases you'll find that we can do a lot to work with these and I will suggest methodologies. But when it comes to some of the methods we use like response surface modeling and so forth, we're still a bit challenged. We have to make some assumptions and it's a bit difficult. Now, what can we say about uncertainty is I would say in general, we should be representing uncertainty at every chance. If you think about how Upper level management within any organization makes a decision. It's based on an uncertainty model, a P10, a P50, a P90. And then they use that. They put it through decision analysis and they're able to make a decision.
Also, every time you show uncertainty, it helps us understand whether or not features we observe are significant. Take the trend model example that I showed back when we were talking about trend modeling, Kriging, and all of that. And what you can see is in fact that all of these features identified in porosity averaged by layer over depth, there's a lot of wiggles, there's inflections, there's different shapes, and the uncertainty bound is quite tight, indicating that probably most of those wiggles are significant and we could be considering them for the purpose of modeling. If the uncertainty bound had been very wide, we may have decided only to represent the big features, or we may have suggested that none of these features are important or significant, or we would model it with a very wide uncertainty model. It's important at every turn to try to represent uncertainty in everything that we display. Ergodic fluctuations. In the good old days, ergodic fluctuations was, were the way that we represented uncertainty with a spatial model. It was treated as a comprehensive measure of uncertainty. We would take stochastic realizations conditional to the data, trends and so forth, we would run them, and then we'd look at what came out at the other side and surprise, surprise, the varigram would not be perfectly reproduced. This could be the geometric anastropy model shown here with a slight ratio of anastropy, and the resulting models coming back in one direction would show a mix of different degrees of honoring that information. We would put an input target histogram into simulation, and then we would look at what came out on the other side, and we would be, oh, that's uncertainty in the distribution. Now we accept that we should be taking ownership of parameter uncertainty, not leaving it to ergodic fluctuations, but instead making a decision to say a high, mid, low case, a P10, a P50, P90. Now what's interesting is that there's nothing magical about ergodic fluctuations. In fact, we can predict the level of ergodic fluctuations in a model directly from the concept of dispersion variance. We got into more details in the other section on scale, but we can do it simply by calculating the amount of variability we would anticipate for the volume of the model within infinity. And that would tell you exactly what your ergodic fluctuation should be. In fact, what we learn from that, it really will be a function of the varigram range and the model size. Now, beyond the dispersion variance, it's not perfect. There is the issue around data conditioning and its influence in stabilizing the statistics of a realization. Now, what we will say in general, though, ergodic fluctuations do not completely account for uncertainty in the model statistics. We can't leave it for the model to figure it out for you. We have to take ownership of the specific parameter uncertainty in our model. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop right there, and then I will carry on with further discussions around how we calculate and work with uncertainty. Thank you very much for following along. As usual, I hope that this is helpful. I'm Michael Perch, Associate Professor at University of Texas at Austin on Twitter, GitHub, YouTube. I'm the Geostats guy. All right. Talk to you later.